This is the Criterion Creeps podcast, and tonight we're talking about Schizopolis from 1996, directed by Steven Soderbergh. The mm-hmm. tagline for the film, RJ, mm-hmm. come early, come often. And the synopsis from Letterboxd. Okay. A man works for the unpleasant guru of a Scientology-like movement. What? Is that actually the synopsis? That is actually the synopsis. Um, a truly lousy synopsis. So what does the Criterion DVD actually say? Yeah. Fletcher Munson has a doppelganger and dentist Dr. Jeffrey Korchek. In his only starring performance to date, acclaimed director Steven Soderbergh inhabits both roles. Munson, onanistic corporate drone and speechwriter for New Age guru T. Azimuth Schweitzer, 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 and the swinging Korchek music enthusiast and lover to Munson's disenchanted wife. Meanwhile, mad exterminator and part-time celebrity prima donna Elmo Oxygen seduces local housewives in secret code in plots against Schweiters. Placing the onus squarely on the viewer, quote, if you don't understand this film, it's your fault and not ours. Writer, director, mm. editor, cameraman Soderbergh presents a deranged comedy of confused identity, double speak, and white knuckled corporate intrigue, confirming his status as one of America's most daring and unpredictable filmmakers. I, uh, white knuckled corporate intrigue. Yes. Yes. Wow. Do you think how many degrees do you think the person who wrote that had? <laughs> that copy? Yeah, that that little copy there? A few. That's... Interesting uh description, Jer. Yeah. So Schizopolis in me. So this is a movie that has been <laughs> long on my radar. Uh I was a fan of Steven Soderbergh at this point in time when it came out uh on DVD, probably two thousand three, two thousand four maybe even now. Okay. And this movie sounded kind of fascinating. Mm-hmm. Like no, I could never really figure out what this thing was about. Like you read the synopsis and you're like, how does this work as a movie? Mm-hmm. But RJ, I always hated the DVD cover for this. Have you seen it? Have you looked this is thing it, up? Is it the same as the letterboxed poster? No. Okay. I'll check it out. Okay. You, uh, you tell me maybe describe for the fans out there. So what... it, it's like, it's kind of like Max Headroom ish. Um, uh, it's Soderbergh oh. and he's like, he's super waxy and yeah, like, it just, it looks like a such a smug looking movie and I'm like I don't know about this. I do I want to spend 42.99 blind on this movie cuz there's like no other way to watch it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It just it suddenly looked wrong and off to me. It it kind of looks like one of those weekly world news magazines at the grocery store. Yeah. That's that's what I'm getting out of. Yeah, this. it's it's like very much like an advertising marketing kind of idea that they're going for because the movie right. starts off with this like the Soderbergh in a character doing this like soft sell, hard sell for the film, where it's like very like, you're aware mm-hmm. of the camera cuts, all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what I was saying though is like so there were things about this on paper that I admired without seeing it. You know, it's a shoestring budget. It's a movie that's just like you're working with your friends. You use yourself as an actor because you can rely on yourself. And hell, if you got two roles, it's like might as well cast myself twice in the movie. And uh, Heck yeah. And he uh, borrowed a bunch of equipment to make it and shot it in like no time with no money. So I was like, I'm always curious about these sort of movies and like what people mm-hmm. can do with it. Steven Soderbergh, he's kind of a he's a name, right? It's, it's, I'm curious what he did before you know he went on to direct, you know, Out of Sight, The Limey, Aaron Brockovich, <laughs> Traffic. Ocean's Eleven. Mm-hmm. Wait, what's he? What's he going to be doing? Sure. So he made this uh, apparently. Cause, so he had made Sex Lies and Videotapes a decade earlier. So this isn't like a first film. This is him. Uh, as a lot of people have mentioned, uh, it seems like he's like working through some stuff. Like he's almost like trying to like make a student film because he he never got to make one, which is absurd. Uh, so why? Why would you want to regress? It, it, it's a good question. Some people do. Some people like to de-skill RJ. They like to okay. see what the ch- they like to set themselves up with some challenges. And he's okay. and he doesn't do this just once. He winds up doing that with the movie Full Frontal, which is not mm-hmm. very good at all. And he also did it with another movie called Bubble. Uh, and mm-hmm. there was the other movie recently that kind of had the same thing, where he strips down the whole process and just shooting with like digital and just doing short little stories. I can't remember. Uh, it's that thriller that he came out with that was quite a bit like that. What's it side called? Side effects? Not side effects. That was like also the B side to like Contagion, but what? Uh, it's, it's the slasher movie. Or it's like the thriller that just came out, and I watched where she the thinks one she's being stalked. On the cell phone? No, 
or no, it was wasn't it filmed on a cell phone? Yes, that one. Yeah. Uh. Well, where? Oh, it's uh this one. What is it called? Yeah. Unsane. Unsane. There you go. See that? There you go. Th- th- that's a far more successful film. We'll just say that. But okay. He likes to put these challenges up for himself. So he shot this in his hometown of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Oh, Baton Rouge, eh? That's right, a. Eh? Oh, I know all about. Well, I, I know about Baton Rouge. Garth Brooks used to uh, tell me about it when I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you know, Soderbergh he'd made uh, sex life videotapes already, and then he mm-hmm. he made his Kafka movie. Uh, with Jeremy Irons, there's King of the Hill, The Underneath. Uh, the mm-hmm. same here, he put this out. He also did a Grey's and uh, this movie called, or this film called Grey's Anatomy, which is a Spalding Gray concert he filmed. Okay. And, then, and then he went on to like, you know, that kind of more mainstream Hollywood success after that. But mm-hmm. uh, he had Schizopolis to get out of his system. <laughs> oh, and boy, did he get it out. Did he get it out. So mm-hmm. uh, Steven Soderbergh makes the decision to play the main character. And he has zero acting skills or abilities. So there's I, that. There's that. I, I wasn't super bothered by that. No, but like but it's very this. clear that this <laughs> he is he is playing this character. Um, oh yes. Yeah, Fletcher Munson. Uh uh-huh. as well as the doppelganger, the inexplicable doppelganger, beyond the fact mm-hmm. that it just makes sense to do it that way because I can just cast myself twice and I can use my wife, Betsy Brantley, as my wife. Hundred percent. Which I didn't know when I was watching this, but I I I was watching it. and I went, I bet she is his wife because that's all mm. these that's all this goes. And sure enough, when confirmation comes. She's Mrs. Munson and attractive woman number two. Attractive woman number two. I think that's a little garish to, like. I mean, I know he thinks she's attractive, but like to say that it's attractive in the credits, even like because that's assuming other people will find her attractive. Also, it's fine. Well, I mean, I would never assume that for you. I don't want to assume what you think is well, attractive, Jared. I'm, I'm glad that you are keeping I'm, me in your thoughts. I'm take, taking a hard stance on this. I will never judge a woman or a man by what I think your attractiveness to them is going to be. I see. That's that's fair. Tough, but fair. Yeah. I guess he's speaking for himself. In this movie, RJ, as I been mentioned, is onanistic. Some might even call it a well, circle jerk. Oh, is that the, this, uh... this movie's about just jerking off? Because <laughs> oh. th- that happens a few times in the movie. That's true, actually. Very, it does very, happen a few times. Very discreetly. You know, it's, there's no, like, uh, you know, it's not Robert Pattinson in The Lighthouse or anything like that. Um, oh, okay. But, but uh, it's definitely, you get some Soderbergh mm. uh, pulling pud. Do you think that's why he wanted to act in the role himself? I mean, since he was there already. Might, might as well, right? So, might as well. So, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And him and his wife, uh, where I think we're like in the process of getting divorced when this got made. So, like during it was filmed or just well, like a- after the fact? Okay. So, but who knows how long it took to actually film this thing, other than like or what the time period was from when it got released. Uh, I think at, mm-hmm. at Con. <laughs> oh, which one? Uh, the original. Comma? Con. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, so here, uh, this is uh, Roger Ebert's uh, opening paragraph for Full Frontal, another oh, wow. uh, st- another Steven Soderbergh uh, failure. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, perhaps as an exercise in humility, Steven Soderbergh makes a truly inexplicable film. There was the con uh, secret screening of his Schizopolis in 1996, which had audiences filing out with sad, thoughtful faces. And now here is Full Frontal, a film so amateurish that the only professionalism of some, that only the professionalism of some of the actors makes it watchable. Mm. So he's got a... There, there's Tough like, but fair. There's moments in Schizopolis that feel like mm-hmm. you're watching a Soderbergh film. Uh, kind mm-hmm. of like when things are being followed. It's actually more in the like, maybe the second half of the movie that it kind of like starts feeling like a, like a real movie. Yep. That's like just very like low budget, independent. Mm-hmm. But I agree. That first half, oh boy. Well, what about it, Jer? I just want to ask you, RJ. I had a question here for you, RJ. Sure. What is art? Art isn't real, Jared. I'm, I'm baiting that hook because art isn't real, and uh, this is a prime example of why 
White people want to take money from the arts, I think, uh, <laughs> is what I would well, say. Well, this is the thing, though. It's like you can make this for cheap. Like, you don't even need money to yeah. make this. But so then there's, there's, but you, then, can, you, can, you can't even take that money from them. There's like there's no money to take, RJ. It's it's the it's the it's the it's the it's the success that comes later for this gentleman. I believe that uh, is what people would uh, okay. look back and okay. not be fair on. All right. That so this film, it's very postmodern, um, uh, and it, but it's trying to be a comedy and. It doesn't work as a comedy, really right. at all. Um, I don't know. It's tough. This is a tough comedy, and it's not even that old. But I feel like there was a window of time where there was films like this. There was this one I remember watching, like in the like two thousand, called Haiku Tunnel, and it reminded me so much of that. Like there was always like if you were kind of going into the you know those movies that have kind of peculiar looking covers, they look like they're comedies and they're mm-hmm. like made for, you know, less than a million dollars with a bunch of people who you don't know. They all yeah. feel, they, a lot of them felt like this, but you watched them back then because maybe one of them might be really good, but one of them might also be like the last supper or something like that. There's these, these movies that people are trying to make it. Cause Hey, if you make it big, you could become the next Steven Soderbergh. And here's Steven Soderbergh. Who's like backtracking. It's, it's it's really it's strange. You could be the next David Gordon Green, Jer. That's true. That is that is true. Uh, yep. So you know how good David Lynch's Lost Highway is. Uh yes, I I, yep. I think that is a good show. So that there's some similarities between these two. Uh, I would love for you to explain just, that in a little more just, detail. Just like this idea of like these like kind of doppelgangers and like be kind of getting into the mind of another person. Uh, you have mm-hmm. actors doing double duty. Lost I was came out the year after this. So okay. um, Lost I was already like in production when this was probably being filmed and released simultaneously. Um, but maybe but, not. Maybe but David this, Lynch. But, so, but we know how good Lost Highway is. This is the opposite mm-hmm. of that. Um, I, I was mm-hmm. really uh, kind of laughing to myself while watching this movie, just knowing that there's our uh, our listener faithful who follow along and watch these movies <laughs> right along with us. This is on the uh-huh. Criterion channel, and they're going to be watching this mm-hmm. too. And I'm just like, oh boy, our audience, they hate this shit. They're going to hate it so much. It's... This is uh, it's this is different than just Stan, the audience. This is different than Stan Brackage, but uh, uh-huh. <laughs> this is this is uh, there's a lot of failure on display. There's a lot of failure. That's a that's a kind way to put that. Yeah. So yeah. there's scenes. So actually, maybe I will attempt to like lay out how this movie flows, but I'm gonna fail. It, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fail miserably. Sure. So there's scenes where. Um, Steven Soderbergh's Fletcher character, he's having like dream sequences, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then, but he's also got his day job where he works for this uh, new age Scientology mishmash organization called Eventualism. Okay. It's like not a bad name for a, uh, for a cult. Mm-hmm. There's these like insets with like news footage where like news broadcasts are doing jokes. Uh, like things that are supposed to be really funny, but... Mm-hmm. They don't really land. No. Nope. There's there's Elmo Oxygen, this this filthy sex crazed uh, ins- exterminator who uh, apparently is irresistible to ladies, to horny housewives all around. Mm-hmm. Kind of reminded me of you, to be honest. <sighs> wow, thank you. Um, yes. So everything involving Elmo Oxygen was quite a chore and it just seemed like this idea stuffed in there it ties up in the end doesn't it though i disagree (laughs) well okay uh so we have scenes rj involving Uh elmo oxygen and mrs nameless number head man sure they have a a dialogue that goes like this uh mrs nameless number head man arsenal nose army elmo oxygen says nose army Beef diaper, nomenclature, throbbing dust generation, drum tissue outburst, jigsaw, uh, fragment chief butter, king surgery mind, bunny bucket, precision galley sponge, 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 smell, smell sign. 
I think the best part of that was the made up word you threw in there. I think spoonge is a terrific word. Spoonge. Spoonge. So there's that. There's uh, the scene when uh, Fletcher returns home to meet his wife and daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they have a conversation along the lines of passive aggressive remark. Mm -hmm. And then generic response. Generic response. Thoughtful inclination looking out the window. Yes, and they do this thing. It's all very clever. <laughs> yes, it, isn't it though, Jer? Isn't it so clever? It's so clever, and uh-huh. it's just oh, it's, they're trying. Mm-hmm. I think. I think they're trying. I think. I think. So, uh, yeah, this movie, as a listener friend of the show, Justin Peterson calls a clusterfuck. Sure. Um, it just. It just doesn't work. No one, like, I, it, people seem to like this on Letterbox, though. It's, <laughs> people. I'd love to meet these people in real life. <laughs> I, I guess it's the people who are going out of their way to watch Schizopolis nowadays. But, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of surprised because I don't know. There's, like, so many better examples of, I think, this type of thing that probably exists. I'm not going to name mm-hmm. them off the top of my head. But there's got to be, like, yeah. films that have this, like, quirky sensibility that are mm-hmm. actually fun to watch or entertaining. And <laughs> uh yeah, I agree with you. I don't want to name any off the top of my head either, but um quirky sensibility, what about uh, Gilmore Girls, Jarrett? That's oh, well, pretty quirky. Well, I mean, this is this isn't even That's the sharp same dialogue. This doesn't fit into this type of movie, but I mean for and for office comedies, I mean, a few years later, you have Office Space come along. Yeah. I mean, are Soderbergh and Mike Judge friends? Because I feel like they would be, but maybe not good Cause friends. Because they're, they're both like, bald hey, dudes. They probably hey, bud. they like all uh, all people in the the industry. I'm sure they've uh, given each other a nod, a nod and a, a something wink. else, a wink, nod and a wink. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't know any offhand, but um, I agree with you. What what were you saying before that? I've already lost my train of thought. I'm I'm all scattered around. I'm all schizopolis over exactly. here. Exactly. Exactly, uh-huh. schizoid. Schizoid. That even even the title is clever, Jared. Yeah. Do you get it? We get, you get it? we have scenes of uh, the, the the dentist making his puns. It's all Soderbergh, because apparently in this world, Fletcher's <sighs> wife is having an affair with Fletcher's doppelganger, this dentist, and they're they're about to make they're about to do it. They're about to set off and like have a new life and leave that loser Fletcher uh, to work at the his drone office job. But sure. then uh, the dentist meets attractive woman number two, played by Soderbergh's wife, and she, she the difference is she has her hair slicked back and wears glasses, mm-hmm. and he falls in love with her, sends her a very lurid letter, hand delivers it to her door, and then there is legal action. Uh, well, of course, rightfully so. Yes. I believe. Yeah, it's a pretty obscene letter, and uh, can, and eventually, I, what, what, what? Can I drop something on you? Yo, I didn't think it was a doppelganger thing. I thought it was an even more on the nose, clever type bullshit where it was both versions of these people were cheating on each other with themselves, but it was like because they were putting on personas as of other people that they like bought into their own bullshit. And I realize that's, I'll, I'll always be honest with you, Jer. If I don't notice that there's two actors playing the same person, I'll tell you about it. So I didn't realize there was any doppelganger stuff. I kind of just thought it was like, I thought it was even more like artsy type, <laughs> like wink, wink at you. It's like, look, it's just how real fairs are. People are cheating on each other, but they're cheating on themselves, man. I thought it was like that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. Maybe what I'm about, way well, off. What about but... the scene when the uh, dentist gets murdered? I mean, that. Like, when, when it got into that stuff, I was kind of like, okay. Yeah. I, I pieced it out eventually. But for, I would say, 90% of this movie, I thought it was just the same people. And it was it was real wink, wink stuff. I see. I see. Well, so I mean, that's like, a, I'll never lie to you. That, that's an interpretation, but sure. I mean, it, it's kind of tough. It's kind of tough going mm-hmm. with this bad boy. But I don't know if it's uh, trying to pull some uh, some Nolan esque antics or anything like that, or even like sub Nolan uh, <laughs> inside antics. But 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's what it is, I think. Yes. And uh, how about that scene like where we get in the third, because the movie is in three acts, where there's like a, mm-hmm. uh, it's a door number that you put on the side of your house. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one, two, three. And then the third, you get the emphasis on uh, Mrs. Munson. Mm-hmm. And you get a scene where, like, you're getting re-experience scenes from the first part, but now Steven Soderbergh's characters are dubbed by French or Japanese or mm-hmm. like Russian men, Spanish men, and it, there's and, whatever, and they're literally just dubbed over. Like he's talking, mm-hmm. but now it's a new voice, and you're like, oh, I see. Everything becomes more clear now, <laughs> and um, yeah. There's that flourish. Oh, sure there is. I I was uh, watching that and I was like, man, I wonder what Jared's going to think about this. He's probably just like so into, oh, yeah, look at this. Look look at this film craft here. It's speaking different languages. It's just like movies, man. <laughs> or I was laughing. Oh, I was like yeah. laughing so uh, hard. This is what a great joke. Meeting genius. Hey, RJ. Yo. What did you think of Schizopolis? Um, well... I think I maybe uh, let my um, my overall or my underall opinions kind of come through a little bit in my speakings. Uh, I do not think anyone will be surprised by the fact that I am not a fan of Schizopolis. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, I started off with a, uh, a very I – gave, I gave it a good college try. I gave it. I, I gave it the old try. I um. I was like, oh, let's see where this goes. It started off with that thing where was, you you don't like this, then it's your problem. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll, let's see. Uh, and then I even started a column where I had good on the left and <laughs> not good on the right. Uh, I had one thing. Uh, I had two things in the good column, Jarrett. Okay. Uh, the screenshot of beef diaper. Mm. Just because I thought that was funny. Uh, and then Naked Bike Man. Uh, I liked the scene of the guy uh, who was Pooh Bear in it with the with a shirt but no pants. Oh, yeah. Right in the bike. Uh, I just – not like the setup or where – like at, as he's a living title card. I didn't care for that stuff. I just liked the scene of him naked riding that bike. And there is some uh, good cool. old like male frontal nudity right at the very end. It's like the yes. last shot of the movie. That's always yep. appreciated. That's always appreciated, yeah. So I, I did like the naked guy. And then I started keeping track of the not good. Oh. And then and then I just stopped after yeah. a while because I was like, I don't got all day. <laughs> uh, I, well, it's only an hour and a half. Like, I don't got all day, Jared. That, that's got to be in the good side right it's only an hour 30 well, yeah no i i agree with you that is on the good side no it's mostly a lot of the stuff that you were kind of saying i thought i thought it was like really scattered i was like it's i know why it's doing this but it is it's overreaching here it's trying to be too many things um and i know that that's the point i get that i understand that the point is that it's like that but i was like i'm just not on board with this it's fucking all over the place the things that they're trying to do they're either not doing well mm-hmm. or they're doing too much of. And it's just like neither of those work. Uh, I didn't like any of the comedy stuff. No. Um, there was like – there were – I'd be hard-pressed to tell you anything that I actually did really kind of take away from this. And that that sounds like a big knock on it, but I don't even think it's – like I don't even – I, I don't dislike this movie that much. It's, it's yeah, just it's, like, it's I, even, I don't even know why this is a thing. Yeah, it's like, not even remarkably bad. I yeah, think it's, it's the, not even remarkably yeah. bad. Because there's a lot of stuff too, like the dialogue. It's like like kind of what you were saying is like, oh, yes, very smart, very clever. You, yeah. you, you worked really hard on this or maybe you didn't and that was the point. This is like a skit, you know? And yeah. It, and it, but it's like it feels so dated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and here yeah. we are doing it and it's a whole bunch of skits assembled. And I'm, I'm positive – like, I don't think Steven Soderbergh is going to be going out of his way to defend this. Although I think he does joke that he wants to make a sequel called Son of Schizopolis. I'm sure he might one day. And, and, but it's, and that's like, he probably holds that in his back pocket and it'll probably never happen. But maybe yeah. if it does, it'll be on Netflix and then one day it'll get released uh, on the Criterion. We didn't talk about our November release or the releases in February. 
Oh, you didn't even talk about famed Roma, famed movie that the even the set was black and white, Jared. Did you know? Yeah, so they could think of black and white. Anyways, yes, um, yes. Uh, so I was, I was kind of what I thought watching this movie was a mix of things, nothing related to the movie itself, but more. I was like, why is, why is this movie? Why am I watching this? And then I was like, why is this in the Criterion Collection? Because I honestly don't... It's one of those things is like, is the novelty of it, is that enough for it to be here? I don't think so. I don't think it warrants. But whatever. It's not like the Criterion is this fucking golden calf that only has 100% bangers all the time, like as we've clearly found. (laughs) After 199 films that we've watched here. Yeah, we're only in like, what, not even a third of the way through. And it's just part, like, pardon me. Oh, almost not even a quarter of the uh, way through. Uh, pardon me. Right. Well, we're, there's well, a thousand. We're not even at two hundred yet, right? We're, we're at two hundred next week, and uh, a thousand. We're, so already, we're they're, they're, and, and they're already past a thousand. It's never going to okay. stop. Yeah, It'll one, never stop. One, so one we're one not fifth. even a fifth of the way through, yeah. and we have an entire handful. You could, I bet, you could pick twenty movies that we've covered so far, and you're like, none of these are good, just trash. <laughs> well, maybe not that far, but it's like none of them are good. You would never watch them again or recommend yeah. them to anyone. Oh yeah, at least twenty of them. Yes. So uh, they're not they're not batting 10%. at a ten percent fail rate. It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it's, it's not higher. Bad. It's higher than ten. But yep. uh... but I I think it, we've talked about it before where it's the false like uh like prestige of this thing where just because it's in there people are like well it's got to be good and then people go in they're like well i mean it, you know is this or that but uh i, I may, maybe i didn't get it but it's in there so it's got it's good right i, I was like well nah. especially after you if you bought this for full retail price or something I oh mean, fuck whew, yeah you, you're gonna find all sorts of things you're gonna like about it it's got two commentary tracks to what end <laughs> do you know it's probably ones in character, probably. I don't know. Just shameful, by all <laughs> accounts. I don't know. I um, and it's like I said, it's nothing like so bad that you're like there. There's movies we've watched where I've been like, I outright hate this thing. Yeah. And I don't this movie. I just like I don't fucking give a shit. Like who? It's here. I kind of wish I didn't watch it, but it's too late now. So, oh well. Right. Yeah. Got any? What what were some of your notes about things you hated or Uh, not goods? Not goods. Not goods were mostly is like one of them was just the two scattered thing. Not good. I do not like Elmo the Exterminator. I thought that whole story was stupid. The the like coded dialogue and the play where it's like, hey, it's not what you'd expect. This exterminator is like killing the ladies out there isn't it funny because it's it's that's not how it works and i was like "Mm, i don't like any of that uh i didn't like the office play stuff i wasn't even really a fan of that either because i think all this talk of spies and things like that i was like well maybe you know i bet office lice office not office lice but office life it's probably like that because people probably like dream up these elaborate things going on in the offices just to like get the day to go by. I imagine that might be what it's like. I don't know. I've never worked in an office, so don't ask me. But I kind of I saw that it too is like I don't think this is something that's really happening. I, I kind of feel like it's just this concoction that these people have made up to kind of get through the day or so. Kind of like making faces in the mirror or uh pleasuring oneself in the bathroom mm-hmm. what, what, like where a man with uh fancy socks takes off his socks and stands there barefoot on bathroom tile and mm-hmm. starts telling you what you need to write in the speech for the guru of the corporate entity that you work for so we've made clear very like many times uh, about how we feel about things in bathrooms and mm-hmm. the stuff people were doing. So Andrea had a new one two days ago. She went into the bathroom, Jared, and somebody left uh, a unopened can of Monster in the stall. Guess where they put it? Right by the can. On the toilet seat. 
She opened the stall door. So and was, there the, was, a, was the seat down? The seat was down. Yeah. The seat was down. And there was an unopened can of monster on the seat. Oh. Uh, I mean, I drank it still because a free monster is a free monster. But uh, no, I, she told me this and I was like, God, I was like, humans, just, just animals, <laughs> you know? But yeah, there was, um. so I didn't like that office stuff. Uh, it was kind of like I said earlier, I thought I didn't see it as a doppelganger thing. I kind of thought it was just like an even more wink winky thing where it's like, it's them and it's themselves. Isn't and this that, is isn't, how... isn't that all, all doppelganger stories? Yeah, it is. Right. It's like, it's, it's like, you. It's like, it's uh, just different. Our, our boy, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Who, and like, who are the real monsters? Well, clearly the people who made this movie, but like that, that's the kind of thing too. It's like, I don't have a problem with doppelganger movies. It's, it's an exploration of self, man. Uh, I just didn't like how it was presented here. Cause I was like, I'm not into this. I don't know why this is. Cause isn't she uh, like, cause like the one bit where, uh, Mrs. Munson like telepathically jumps into the mind of mm-hmm. attractive woman number two. And then she's yeah. experienced life. Then she looks over and the table is empty. Oh man, man. Oh, well, man, <laughs> See, that, that's what I mean, dude. It's just stuff like that. Like, and I'm not even, I, I won't even give them the people who like this stuff a hard time. It's like, whatever. If you, if you think this is cool, go for it. It's just, I do not get anything out of that. I was like, ugh. Yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. No, thanks. No argument so that's, for me. Um, I think a uh, friend of the show, Rupa Granger, said it best. Well, I've, said, uh, hey, hey. Oh, okay. All right. I won't, I won't, uh, I won't yeah, do another you, you, you want to hear about who hates Schizopolis? Uh, yeah, we could hear about who hates Schizopolis. So half a star from Red Dead Rupa. You must be a video game fan. Schizopolis. <laughs> Schizopolis. That was excruciating. Honestly... I um I couldn't have said it better myself. Shit's Opolis. I agree. I wish I had come up with it to be to be very honest I, with I, you. I can't believe you slept on it. Well, I mean, I don't I, I do the Jared approach where I try not to uh I try not to give my opinions out there on these movies until uh we drop those reviews. Yep. Not that anyone cares. Uh but I don't know. I, so I'm trying to look at Rupa's three five-star films but my letterbox is not loading at the moment let's see all right red dead rupa she, oh, oh only five only three five-star films jared one of yours t2 judgment day yeah uh one cut of the dead is in there and then one of the most depressing movies i've ever seen under the skin oh i had a really hard time watching that movie it made me really sad really yeah, so uh, those are some of Red Dead Rupa's faves. <sighs> Seems fine by me. Yeah, story checks out. Half star from Smoreni Smaj. That's close enough. Unwatchable. I get the idea behind this movie, and I must acknowledge few really ingenious dialogues and monologues, but overall, the movie is almost completely unwatchable. It is satire, so technically speaking, it is a comedy, but it is not funny or entertaining at all. It's just plain boring. Mm -hmm. It is obvious that movie is done by someone very smart who has done many things to say, who has many things to say, but who is at the same time so self-involved in own smartness that he made this movie understandable only to himself. The movie is unwatchable both in the story and in an aspect of technical realization. It is extremely rare, but it happened. I gave up on this movie before the end. I did it just a few times in my life, gave up on single-digit number of movies out of thousands I saw so far, but I could not force myself to see Mm. this through. This is one of those things that remind me that life is too short to waste it on literally every crap I run into. I'm sorry to do this because I can tell that basic idea was awesome in author's head, but he terribly failed to make something good out of it. So I must rate it. Uh, I agree with them, but I do find it funny that they say someone so self-involved in their own or self involved in their own selfness. However you phrase that or however they 
he, she, or they phrased it. Uh, but they also gave five stars to Dogma and Chasing Amy, talking huh. about people involved in themselves. And uh, also Boyhood, five stars. I feel like Boyhood is uh, one of those ultimate um, self-involved things from our buddy Richard Rinklater. Good but this person also... <laughs> Rick later. This person also gave Barfly five stars, so that's pretty hey. good. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Not too bad. All right. Yeah. Um, you want to hear about who loves this movie potentially? Maybe, but maybe not like maybe not too much. No, these just... people are gonna bum me out. All oh, right, all right. Who's the one? okay? Well, here's maybe one. like oh, okay. Oh, I got one here. Here's Tom Ass Haywood. <laughs> Five stars. I have no fucking clue what I just watched, but I'm pretty sure it's genius. Uh, I don't like that. I've, n- I've never been a fan of that kind of cop-out thing. This person also gave Chasing Amy five stars. Huh. Uh, I do like their name, though. Tom yeah. Ass. <laughs> and they gave Dogma five stars, too. Interesting. Um, and then a little bit down here, we have Phil Bernstein, who gave it five okay. stars. Nomenclature. Felt like shit on Monday night, and it turns out that rewatching this in bed while eating applesauce was just what the doctor ordered. I mean, not totally, because I felt like shit yesterday, too, but it helped. I wonder why, um, like, I'm not knocking this in any sense, but I wonder why people feel the need to uh, put, like, very current day issues into their reviews. Is it, like, for the people reading their reviews? Di- di- well, like... some people view it as a diary. I guess. I don't yeah, know if okay. they're writing it for the podcast by any means. Are you saying that when Phil Bernstein wrote his review for Schizopolis, he did not intend Ooh. to have a podcast bring it up years later? Uh, second from the bottom here, RJ, we have Asher, five stars. Uh-huh. Contrived greeting, explanation of the experimental plot structure, thought-provoking inquiry about Soderbergh, approval of the spontaneous production choices and ironic dialogue, two-dimensional comment about the corporate culture themes, conclusive reiteration of opinion of the film. Mm-hmm. See what they did there? Uh, I, uh, I'm i aware of what they did there. They, um, Since you brought it up earlier, they gave Enemy, or it's one of their favorite films. I bet. Yeah. They have other movies, too. Let's see what their half star Grand Torino. <laughs> <laughs> People really hate that movie, eh? I haven't thought about it since seeing it. Yeah, but I, I've noticed like so many people give Gran Torino like half a star or one star, and it's like, why? Is it is it bad? I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of like Mel Gibson. No, that's all I had. Okay. Oh, this person. No, oh, okay. This person's getting into weird, stupid stuff. Like they they just reviewed you were never he- really here, and, and the review said Google Epstein. Very topical stuff, Jarrett. Very topical. Huh. Well, okay. any last thoughts here on nah. Schizopolis? I mean, I don't like it, but I don't hate hate on it, if you that know. makes sense. I that, don't think it's good. No, it's it's not. It's not a good movie. It's, yeah. uh, yep, it's there. It's in the Criterion Collection. It's definitely there, man. The pen- it's a... Uh, yeah. yeah. After the break, mm-hmm. we're gonna kill some gurus. What kind? The well, there's no such thing as a good guru, probably. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Take take your pick. Uh, um. Afterwards, spirits? we'll yep. be dragged off by men <laughs> with their pants off. What are they gonna do? Hopefully do something about it. 